Thank you for the invitation to speak today. Um, let me just check. Great. Well, um, first of all, it's a beautiful day out there, and uh, it's really good because if it had been raining, I wouldn't have come. Um, but um, I want to uh, give you a brief introduction about myself and, um, and then take you on a journey through uh, my own experiences uh, in biotechnology, from a journey from, in, uh, from microbiology all the way to uh, digital technologies and their application in science. Riffin itself is a company I founded four years ago. We develop and provide cloud-based software for uh, experimental design and real-time analytics to biotechnology and pharmaceutical companies. Um, and um, my own journey started actually uh, 20 years ago myself. In fact, it started with, uh, uh, I picked up my first pipette in uh, November of 1998. And that was also the birth of synthetic biology, which is the field that I got my own start in. And uh, since that time, I've taken a journey through uh, through um, uh, from uh, microbiology to industrial fermentation to pharmaceuticals and statistical learning and digital technologies. And most recently, with these past four years, my focus on digital technologies has really been driven by the belief that, uh, above all else, our path to uh, new products, faster uh, uh, delivery of these products to market in biotechnology is really uh, one that, that, that will be enabled by uh, digital transformation. So I want to start that with uh, uh, a look at industrial biotechnology and some of the uh, uh, capabilities that have been built over the years to try to um, bring about a bio-based economy. It's something that I think we all at some level really hope to achieve and, and have aspirations to achieve. But the question is, have we really uh, made progress towards that goal, towards that, that dream? And, uh, I look at it from the lens of industrial fermentation, which is where I spent a great proportion of my past 20 years in, in biotechnology. Um, and one of the first industrial fermentations was glutamate, or umami if you uh, buy it in Japan, or it's also MSG, known as MSG. It's sometimes thought of as the fifth uh, taste. And umami was, was uh, initially produced in 1907 through the purification of uh, glutamate from plant proteins. Uh, and in 1957, the first fermentation process was developed. It was actually developed by screening and selecting for bacteria that could produce that. So that was about a 50-year journey from its discovery to fermentation-based process. Um, some years later, in 2006, uh, DuPont and Tate and Lyle developed uh, 1,3-PDO, propane diol, which is a three-carbon molecule. And the, the the R&D effort to deliver that to market took 15 years. Um, some years after that, 2011, a company I worked at produced, uh, Amaris, produced a compound called Farnesine, a 15-carbon uh, secondary metabolite from the uh, isoprenoid pathway. Uh, and that took six years with not six genes, but 22 genes engineered into the pathway. So from this perspective, from this lens, we started to uh, make great strides and improvements in the, in the development of, of uh, industrial bioproducts um, using advanced technologies. But that really, that really wasn't, uh, that isn't quite the whole story, because each of these products, at least the last two I know, took hundreds of millions of dollars in investment to bring them to market. And even though it's getting faster, it's not really getting cheaper. And when it costs hundreds of millions of dollars to go to market, it also means that only the biggest players have access to the market, and only billion-dollar products can be developed and sold. And the dreams that many of us have for a green, a cleaner, a greener, a bio-based economy envisions products that might only have markets of 15 or 30 or 50 million dollars. But you cannot spend 300 or 400 million dollars to develop such products. So how can we get there? Um, and I think the answer is to look actually not just at the, neat, the latest gadgets and gizmos and widgets of biotech in the molecular space or the latest instrumentation. We actually have to look at the fundamental processes by which we do science. So let me take you on that, that story and how I got to that conclusion. So it starts, as I said, 20 years ago in 1998 when I picked up my first pipette. Um, and this is the world of genetic engineering in 1998. 
you would pick up a paper, you would read the methods section if you wanted to try to use those technologies of that work, and you would read things like this. The promoter fragment was cloned as an eco R1 XHO fragment into P Gus cut with eco R1 SMA1 resulting plasma, blah, 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 blah. You would have to parse that that story and try to recapitulate what it was that they actually did without any real blueprints or specification of what that was. And that was an incredibly difficult task. I liken it to the way that the Swedes built the Vasa. How many of you are familiar with the Vasa? Have you visited this? It's a fantastic museum in, in Stockholm. Uh, the Vasa is a ship that was built in the in 1600s by the king of Sweden who was at war with the Poles, and he wanted to intimidate the heck out of the Poles with their amazing technology. So he asked for a ship that was twice as tall as the last ship they'd ever built. Now, how did they build ships back then? Basically, they had empirical rules. They would just basically use their experience of decades or even centuries to build it. They didn't have any physics. So when he said build a taller ship, they just put another deck on top of the same ships they built before. When it was finished, they put 200 dignitaries on the ship. They launched it out into the harbor. It went about 200 meters out in the harbor. The wind blew, and it tipped over and sank to the bottom. And that's how we do genetic engineering then. And to be honest, it's a lot how we do genetic engineering in life sciences today. Essentially, we send out dozens. Actually, we send out thousands, if not millions, of vases out into the water, and we just let them all tip over and hope that one of them doesn't. And when we find the one that doesn't tip over, we have hopefully a new compound or a new drug or a new discovery. That seems a little bit silly. And when I looked at this in, uh, 20 years ago, I thought there has to be a better way. I came from an engineering background, um, mechanical engineering, and I thought we can build cars, we can build electronics, why can't we build biology this way? And so the, the future vision that, that motivated me, which I called genetic applets, was the idea that we could program biological systems and model them the way we do our physical systems. We could encode those programs into DNA and download them into the cell and then get novel cell function like cell memory. Um, and in 1998, the Office of Naval Research at, in the US put out a call for proposals for biocomputing. And I, with my uh, advisors, Jim Collins and Charles Cantor, uh, we submitted a proposal, uh, which, as I mentioned, we called genetic applets. Um, and about six months later, they invited all of us to, to present our proposals to an audience of folks from all over the country. And one of the people in attendance was Sidney Brenner, the Nobel Prize winner uh, for discovery of mRNA. And I was a first year graduate student, and I got up on a stage like this to, uh, it's a little bit of a smaller room, to, to present our work thus far. And I showed some really ugly looking bacteria they were short, they were long, they were massively overexpressing GFP, and they weren't very healthy. Um, but I showed them and I explained where I was, and I hadn't been able to get my project to succeed. The, the project was to develop a genetic memory element out of promoters. And, um, and I got about halfway through the presentation, and Sidney Brenner jumps out of the audience, and he says, this is all wrong. It's completely totally wrong. And he walks up to the stage and he picks up a, a chalk and he starts writing on the whiteboard how wrong it was and how, how, the, how it should work. And I was just standing there watching this first presentation ever and I thought this was how science worked. Um, I didn't know that you actually are not supposed to talk about the, your, your negative results. You're only supposed to talk about the positive ones. Um, well, anyway, um, we did end up getting the, the grant and about a month after that presentation I get everything that I had um, talked about to work. So I learned one lesson, which is that even Nobel Prize winners don't know everything. Um, what, that, what that product was was a genetic toggle switch. We published that in 2000. Um, it was basically a cross-repressor system that was in, entirely motivated by the transistor-transistor logic of electronic circuit and the realization you could program the same thing into genes and promoters. And we established the, the, uh, uh, the data that showed that you could produce genetic memory out of any arbitrary circuit, or any circuit elements. Um, at the same time, the very same time, uh, Michael Elowitz and Stan Liebler produced a genetic oscillator. And amazingly, they used exactly the same parts 
with exactly the same principles and the same modeling approaches and we'd never talk to each other. So it's an illustration uh, in some sense of how science evolves. We often believe that we are these lone discoverers uh, forging ahead a path and that we're, it's our pure genius that will, will drive us to these discoveries. But the truth is we're more like antenna picking signals up from the atmosphere. And, uh, and I just happen to be picking up certain signals that so was the, my, our, our colleagues at the same time. Um, science is a collective effort and uh, that sharing is critical. And even more to the important, learning from our past is even more critical. So it turns out that my idea for genetic memory was scooped, uh, was, was predated only by 50 years. Um, so Max Del Burke in 1949 described the possibility of, of, uh, of memory built out of enzyme networks with exactly the same cross-repressive structure. And in their original paper, paper uh, Jacques Minot, Francois Jacob described exactly a bistable circuit that could be constructed to produce arbitrary genetic logic. Um, so we just happened to actually build it because we had the genetic tools to do it at the time. So this is one of the deepest lessons I've learned in my 20 years is that we can forge a better future if we take the time to learn from the past. So we think oft times that innovation is all about seeing the future and doing new things, and it is. And it's about uh, 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 taking the future on without fear, but it's not about forgetting the past because then we just repeat ourselves over and over again. Um, and I want to tell a, a, another story later on in my career, the story of, uh, 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 at Amaris, where I uh, pursued the development of this molecule farnesine and the scale up to industrial quantities, because it is from that that I derived a lot of the lessons that um, are now guiding my uh, work in, in digital transformation of science. So in, in 2011, we were producing um, a small molecule called farnesine, from genetically engineered yeast that consumed sugarcane and produced this molecule in 200,000 liter reactors. Each one of those columns is a 200,000 liter uh, airlift or bubble column reactor. And what, what they're doing is they're shoving massive amounts of, uh, of air through the bottom and the turbines to drive that air are over on the right, those blue buildings. There were six of those buildings, each one the size of about three semi trucks just to drive oxygen into the system. Um, so when we think about fermentation, the first thing we probably think about is ethanol fermentation because it's been around for two billion years. And it's not only, it is truly one of the most phenomenal and, and miraculous uh, uh, biotechnology inventions ever and Mother Nature gave us this invention because you can produce ethanol with zero effort. You literally throw sugar into a pot and let it sit and you get ethanol out. Uh, it can be non-sterile, it's anaerobic, you don't need to feed any oxygen. It's over 90% yield. 90% of the carbon that goes into that, that uh, organism comes out as ethanol. It's virtually impossible to beat. And yet a lot of people fail, uh, they fail to uh, think about the differences between the modern fermentation technologies and ethanol. They try to turn everything into an ethanol product. Process. And we made that mistake at first as well, but over time we learned. And um, the lessons that we derive from this, the ones that I take home, is that when you're starting a new industrialization project, a new uh, market-oriented development project, it's really critical that you not just think about the science in the lab, but also think about the industrial cost drivers that are going to determine whether your product can make it to market. In our case, with farnesine, it was not anaerobic. It was an oxygen-based uh, product uh, process. It was aerobic. It had to be sterile because you couldn't outcompete the other bacteria and other uh, yeast that would want to consume that sugar. So you had to kill them off. Um, the product was centrifuge, not distilled, which means you get a lot more impurities. Um, it had four times higher sugar concentration, 30 times longer run times, and two and a half times higher titer. It completely changes the way you do these things. And these are things you don't think about when you're in the laboratory, but you need to think about them to get to market. And of all, all of those things, the oxygen piece, not the yield, but the oxygen piece was uh, one of the biggest drivers of cost. So with that information in mind, we set out to 
make a, a genetically engineered yeast that could actually produce farnesine at such a high economic efficiency that we could sell it for diesel fuel. That was the original goal. So less than $2 a liter to produce this, to be competitive with, with oil. Um, and where we started was by bringing in a bunch of scientific advisors from around the world and, uh, and having them look at what we were trying to do. And all of them concluded that we would never beat 17% yield in this, in this process. We needed to get well above 20 to achieve anything close to economical. But they said it was impossible. Well, we didn't listen too closely. So now I'm going to give you the contradictory statement. Learn the lessons of the past, but don't listen too, too, too closely to those who tell you uh, uh, you can or can't do things. So we didn't listen too closely. And what we did is we took yeast, and this is the central metabolic pathway of yeast, the, tradition, or the, the native pathway, consumes sucrose or fructose or sugars, and converts it into ethanol to, um, from pyruvate. Um, and it produces some acetyl-CoA. Um, what Amherst first did was take the acetyl-CoA and funnel it down the isoprenoid pathway to produce FPP, farnesine pyrophosphate, and then added an external and exogenous enzyme, farnesine synthase, to draw off the FPP to produce this farnesine. So it was a one-gene engineering uh, transformation. And the next step was to enhance the pathway itself by adding more of the genes in the, the red pathway to boost production. But this only got us so far. We couldn't beat 17% yield, and we could not get the oxygen use we needed. So we took a wild approach. We actually took the, the metabolic pathway from lactobacillus ruteri, and we inserted those genes into yeast, and we almost completely bypassed the central metabolic pathway of yeast to deliver these, uh, the, the carbon to where we needed it to go. Um, this is the equivalent in yeast of a heart-lung transplant. And the result was that we, we were able to extract five of the six carbons in each sugar molecule and send them to this output of farnesine. We increased the max yield from 24 to 30%, the theoretical yield, and reduced the oxygen utilization by uh, 400%, over 400%. Um, and this was by pulling an exogenous central metabolic pathway out. When I proposed this with one of my colleagues, even inside the company, when I first got there, everyone, even in the company, said this can't work. It took me four years to convince anybody to do it. And when we did it, it did work. And now it's at 200,000 liter manufacturing. And these are the results. Um, the blue is the wild type metabolism. The green is the heart-lung transplant. And it shows the dramatic boost in productivity and yield and oxygen efficiency that we gained by taking this bold leap into the future. Um, but getting, getting there was not an easy uh, process. So it's easy to compress years and years of uh, difficult work into a, a short story for a presentation. Um, but the deepest lesson that I learned from this experience was not actually the metabolic engineering itself. There's always metabolic engineering tricks of it out there to be had. Um, but the deeper lesson was how we did the science. Um, and when you're going from a half a liter or half a mil reaction to 200,000 liters, there's a lot of ways to go wrong. In fact, the research effort at Amherst involved the integration of 17 different scientific disciplines into one project, from analytical chemistry to, to uh, genetic engineering, strain screening, fermentation processes, chemical recovery, purification, et cetera. You name it. It was all in there. Um, and when we started out, with this project, we were sloppy. We were taking a, a kind of academic approach to things where we just would do the experiment one at a time. Everybody would sort of do their own experiments. And then we'd make PowerPoint presentations and share our results. But nobody really probed into how we did those experiments. And the result of that approach was we'd have really messy, noisy outcomes. This is a trace of a fermentation done over two weeks uh, showing the, the error in the measurements of the yield on those, those processes. And when you got a result that was this noisy, you would think you had a result, but you weren't 100% sure, but you had no other choice. So you'd say, I think I have a better strain, a better process. You'd send that to manufacturing, and then they'd try it, and you'd see double-digit drops in performance. Everything you thought you had found just disappeared. And there's a term for that in the, in the mythology of science. It's called regression to the mean. 
Um, I laugh at that term because there's no such thing as regression to the mean. What that means is you picked an outlier. You picked an artifact. It wasn't real. Um, so this was a transformative outcome for us because that's hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars lost when you do that, when you send things to manufacturing and it doesn't work. Uh, well, we got smart, and what we did is we built a data integration system and a process quality system that went all the way back to our screening capability when we were still working with half-liter reactions. And we cleared the noise out of our scientific experimentation. And when we did that, what we thought was just an average, mediocre process was actually a process rich with physiological and physical uh, properties. And this is an example of the same fermentation run after we cleared the noise. There was all kinds of things going on from uh, over cell overgrowth to genetics instability to physiological coupling with, with oxygen. Um, once we saw it, we could understood it. We stand it. We even were able to model it. That black curve is a uh, differential equation simulation of the physiology of yeast. It allowed us to predict how it worked. And it also allowed us to make decisions that were true. And when we made those decisions and we sent our strains to manufacturing, they worked. And we were able eventually to cut the time it took to scale to manufacturing from over 12 months to three months and get exact performance reproduction going from half liter to 200,000 liter. So not only did we get there faster, we cut off two stages of piloting uh, from uh, in between. So the deep lesson that I learned about the execution of science is that we often do it poorly. We do it too quickly. We don't consider how we execute those experiments, how we collect our data, how we prove that our measurement systems are actually telling us what we want to know. And so this started my mission to try to deliver technologies to the scientific world that offered more data quality, better context, rapid data integration, and better data access. Because I'd seen it cut the time to market to improve the reliability, and most importantly, allow you to work with your colleagues and solve scientific problems through collaboration on a scale that's much bigger than one person. Um, and yet, with all of these lessons, our own company continued to work this way. We would share information with hand sketches, trying to describe how we did our science. And this particular uh, image came from an email where manufacturing was trying to troubleshoot the, the processes that were sent to them. And they were saying, well, this is how we do it. And I said, well, I can see that you're reaching for something. What you're reaching for is a blueprint of your science. Just the same way that you make a blueprint of your buildings that you build or your automobile before you try to transfer it to manufacturing, we need the same thing for science. Because when you don't have that blueprint, you get locked up. And this is a quote from six months ago from a pharmaceutical company that said it takes them three months to pull the data together from a single development batch to, to make an assessment because the data is so fragmented. And the reason it's so fragmented is because we don't have the blueprints that allow us to integrate data across all of these processes. So when you look at a typical uh, commercialization effort, whether that's pharmaceuticals or biotech or industrial biotech, it involves the integration across the life cycle of dozens of different scientific domains and hundreds of researchers. And doing that without a blueprint is like trying to, uh, it's like trying to put Humpty Dumpty back together again after he falls off the wall. We try to catch all the pieces and the fragments of data that are produced by our science and then reassemble it. And that's not working for uh, the life science industry anymore. So where I am today is attempting to develop a technology and an approach that gives people a faster, better, and easier way to share information to improve their scientific processes and deliver results that are true and of highest quality right from the beginning. And our approach to that stems directly from that, um, that process flow diagram, that sketch that I saw in an email. I saw that and I realized this is what people were stretching for. They wanted a computer-aided design approach to science where you could draw out your experiments, track the information in a computational framework, and deliver that to machine learning 
or visualization or statistical methods in seconds, not in two to three months. And so that's what we've built. It's a cloud-based system to uh, capture experiments as blueprints and to capture all of the attributes of the materials that go in and out of that experiment in real time so that you can compute on that. And the result of that is that you take these blueprints, it can suck all the data in from all of the different aspects of your research, from Excel spreadsheets to electronic notebooks, historians, uh, limb systems, whatever it is that you're collecting the data from, and then it automatically assembles that data into the standard form for machine learning, which is a statistical data table. And it does that in a version controlled environment. So as you change your experiments over time, the system automatically adapts to that. And it allows you to assemble your data and look at it across scales, across time, across people and geography in real time. Um, we've deployed that, this system to uh, customers around the world. One of the first adopters was Novozymes. Um, and they use it to integrate their global R&D from 10 different sites across three uh, continents. And in 18 months, they scaled up to uh, 200 users um, and, and conducted over 2,000 experiments with more than 2 million samples processed on the system. Um, and more recently, we've been working with uh, the Department of Industrial Microbiology at Technical University Delft, where they evaluated the system for their own industrial fermentation processes in an academic setting. And they were able to use it to conduct and capture in intricate detail the entire process from material preparation to uh, microbial physio physiology. And the, the lead on that project, Jack Pronk, said, uh, and this is really uh, in many ways my favorite, uh, favorite outcome of our work so far, he said, uh, this type of detailed web-based description of experimental procedures could become the new standard in scientific publications, thereby increasing the repeatability of scientific research. And this is the, the big goal and hope for this type of approach, is that by creating and sharing blueprints of our research in a computational form, we can advance scientists at much faster pace, not only for the discovery of new scientific outcomes, but also the, the time to market. We can cut the cost of developing new medicines, new products, new industrial biotechnologies by hundreds of millions of dollars by cutting out the uh, inefficiencies and the bad decisions in our science. Um, and I've seen that before. This is yet one final example of the impact that that type of approach has had. This is in screening. Uh, by applying good data principles and, and quality systems methodologies, the same methodologies that were used in automobile fact manufacturing, we cut the error in our screening by sixfold. We doubled the pace at which we were able to discover new molecules and new strains. Um, and that kind of increase in scientific pace is accessible to all of us. And with that, uh, I'll skip over that. Um, and with that, we hope we can uh, accelerate the path to this green bioeconomy that we all hope for. Um, so if you're interested, I will, will mention that um, for the academic community, the nonprofit community, we've made Riffin open access because we realize that uh, this type of technology, even though it's accessible to pharmaceutical companies with decent resources, it's not so easy for a scientific lab in, a, in your university to purchase these types of things. So if you are in a nonprofit, you can get in a free account on Riffin, uh, much like you can get a Gmail account. So thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Tim. It was brilliant, and very interesting and fascinating and impressive what you can do today. So, uh, si vous voulez lui poser des questions, if you want to ask a few questions to Tim Carter, at the moment on this uh, big data revolution analysis. Yeah, okay, on va vous apporter un micro. Voilà, il arrive de l'autre côté. Thank you. You have described this model of uh, the scale up from a 0.5 ml up to a vasa like 200,000 liter approach. But uh, to date, if you take the example, an industry like monoclonal antibody production, 20 years ago they had these similar scale up approaches, going from small scale and with the increase of the titers mm -hmm. to the 10 pack, 6 pack, 10,000 liter by reactor. But uh, today there's a paradigm shift where people are more envisioning continuous processing. 
Do you think that your approaches will be relevant to continuous processing? Uh, yeah, thank you for your question. Um, even more so, um, I, I would say that what, what I've observed in pharmaceuticals is what they're moving to be first and before continuous is to small batch processing. Disposable reactors, 1,000 liters, 500 liters, 100 liters, um, smaller batch sizes that can be run 24 hours a day and turned over in a day to a new product. And the reason for that is driven in large part by uh, orphan drugs and, um, and the shift from single large uh, uh, treatments, therapeutic treatments, to these smaller, more personalized approaches. Um, in fact, half of all drug development is these types of orphan drugs now. So um, the reason that this type of approach of, of high quality, digital, uh, enabled science is even more important is because the cycle times are shorter. The first company to get to market wins the market. So you have to make decisions faster. You have to integrate data faster. You have to uh, go quicker in all aspects. You don't have to scale up. The scale's the same. But you need to get to uh, FDA or EMEA quality production faster. And for that, you need good data. You need uh, design space characterization. You need design of experiments. You need uh, quality systems approaches. Thank you. Yeah. Autre question, another question? Pas d'autres questions? Just a question about money. Um, you told me that out of the four billion dollars invested, there was a lot of loss of money, a lot of money that could have been saved thanks to this strategy. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Um, so I think uh, probably close to a billion dollars was invested to get the Farnazine product to market. Um, a lot of that went into, you know, $100 million to build a plant and things like that. But um, when you look at that last curve I showed, with the same number of people, um, no change in our instrumentation, we were able to double the rate of progress in our screening systems. So at that time, there were about 100 people working on the project, um, which is a roughly a $30 million a year research budget. Um, so we. We took that same number of people and got twice as much out. That's about $15 million, or 50% of the money we were spending was being wasted. So that's $15 million a year for a, a small company. If you multiply that across the world, there's about $400 billion in R&D spent each year. Um, and estimates in the literature put it at 25 to 80% losses. So it's a lot of money down the drain. Great. Thank you very yeah. much. Merci beaucoup. Thanks a lot to Garnet for your participation. <laughs>